Hello. Welcome to another episode of CXO Talk. I am Michael Krigsman. I'm here with my co-host, Vala Afshar. Vala, Michael, always good to see you. And it's good to see you as well. I hope you're doing well, Vala. I'm doing fantastic. Good, good. <laughs> Very and excited about our guests. We have an amazing <laughs> guest. And this is, we're here with Christine Comerford. Christine, how are you? And Christine has no audio. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm here, I'm here. Oh, we hear you, we hear you. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Christine, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's so, so great to be with you guys today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thank Pleasure. you. And, uh, and those of us who know you affectionately call you Christine, high bandwidth, Comifer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. I, I, or, believe it, I believe it was uh, Bill Gates who uh, called you that, right? Yeah, this ain't no dial-up. Yeah. This ain't no dial-up. No dial and, and Christine is an author and a consultant and an advisor to lots and lots of well-known people and companies. Christine, tell us about your new book and your consulting and what does Christine High Bandwidth Comifer do? <laughs> First of all, um, um, our new book, Smart Tribes, Smart How Tribes. Teams Become Brilliant Together. So what we do at our firm, at Christine Comfort Associates, is we work with teams that are already you know, great, doing good things, etc., and we take them to a whole new level using the latest neuroscience techniques. So we do organizational development, executive coaching. The main thing that we do, frankly, is we remove obstacles. Everybody wants something, why don't they have it yet? We find out what those obstacles are to the performance levels that they want, to the emotional engagement levels that they want, to the amazing customer experience that they want, and we use neuroscience techniques to knock those babies down. And what we find is the ROI is profound, and what I love about this stuff is that it's fast, and none of us have any patience anymore because we're in a total ADD society and world. <laughs> Yeah, and we use, yeah, we use these techniques all over the place. So how that's why I love this stuff. How did you, how did you, I mean, certainly the book is about the principles of neuroscience. How did you uh, become interested in that? And, and when did you start really studying the, and associating how, you know, how the mind works and, 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 and correlating that with improved productivity and, and increased ROI and so on and so forth? Good, good, good question. Thanks, Bella. Uh, so at 15 years old, I started studying neuroscience and human behavior and why some people succeed or not, uh, why some people have all that success and are happy or not. And I started out by going to every training program I could. And the first one I went to back then was called EST. Now it's called Landmark. And I was so intrigued by how we can totally create our own reality and we can loop arms with people subconsciously and walk forward together to a win-win future for both, which is a lot of what we do today, back at 15. And then ever since then, I've been applying this to my entire career. Um, I started my first company when, when I was 19, Bank for High Net Worth Individuals, sold that off to Union Bank, built five more companies, sold them off, and then was a venture capitalist, used these techniques with our companies there. Uh, gosh, use these techniques with uh, the Clinton and the Bush administration, four billionaires, 700 of the Fortune 1000. And finally then, um, I wrote this book because our clients kept saying, look, if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, and we hope that you don't, <laughs> but if you do, people need to know this stuff. You can't just go you know, softly off into the night. So, um, so that's why I sat down, because after my first book, I said, that's it, I'm never writing another book, because it's a lot of work, as you know, Paula. Sure. So um, yeah, so that's that's kind of why this book exists because our clients sat me down, several of them repeatedly, and said, "You need to codify this." Sure, sure. So when when people read Smart Tribes, they understand. Ah, here is why I may or may not reach my next revenue inflection point. Here's why I'm not getting what I want. Oh, all these light bulbs go off. Then we step them through how to get what they want. And then we show them a number of case studies and how when you apply the techniques that you just learned in the book, you can get these different results. Right, right. So the book is called Smart Tribes. Tell us about the genesis of the name. It's an interesting name. 
And it also yes. sort of re recalls uh, the no Seth Godin's notions of tribes as well. And, and also, if you don't mind, it, you know, becoming brilliant together. So not only the name Smart Tribes, but again, yeah, how you purposefully emphasize, you know, teamwork as, as, as the path to success. Okay, good, good. First, let's explain maybe the smart state and the critter state. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the whole reason that companies don't perform like they want to is because people are spending too much time in what we call their critter state. This is where we have fight, flight, freeze, frustration, hopelessness. When we're in our critter state, we are being run by subconscious safety programs. And we're looking out and saying, am I safe or not? Am I safe or not? Let me take any behavior, practice any behavior that will keep me safe, which often keeps me small and keeps me not performing at the level I, that I could. Now, we get into critter state when we're in times of rapid growth, when we're in times of lots of change, turnaround, unclear directives. So companies and leaders often send their people unintentionally into their critter state. So what Smart Tribes is about is in the book, we show people how to get into what we call your smart state. Your smart state is where you have the reptilian brain, which is great, okay, safety, belonging, matter, and patterns running there. We have the mammalian brain, fight, fright, freeze, and then we have the neocortex, the outer part of the brain, where we have the prefrontal cortex, right behind the forehead, where we have innovation, collaboration, creativity, the ability to compare where we are with where we want to be and then start to plan how to get there. So when we're in our smart state, when we're using all three parts of our brain, we are deeply emotionally engaged, we are high innovation, high collaboration, high energy, we're not burning out. We're not burning out and our people aren't burning out. When we have a bunch of people in a family, in a company that are operating in their smart state, we call that a smart tribe. When we have a smart tribe, this is where in the first several pages of, of smart tribes, you, you read different testimonials of people saying, oh my God, you know, uh, our marketing messages are 237% more effective. Our R&D, we create new products 28 to 40% faster than we ever did before. Uh, we're closing sales 50% faster. We're closing 44% or more of our pipeline. Our people are 50% more productive. All this stuff comes from getting in and staying in your smart state. Now, to your question, a human being can only do so much. <laughs> this is one of the things that we really learn as we get older, right? It's like, Michael can only do so much, Bala can only do so much, Christine can only do so much. But if our teens, if our teens are in their smart state, if we have 75, 100, 5,000, 20,000, 300,000 people moving forward in their smart state, the results are remarkable. So let's, oh, and let's, we'll talk about tribes in a second. I, it sounds like you have a question, but I really want to go into that primal need sure, to be please, connected. Yeah. Okay. Please. So once we have, what, remember Maslow, he was right. Once we have food, water, shelter, warmth, we, we crave at a subconscious, uh, subterranean, primal level, we crave safety, belonging, and mattering. We need to know that we're safe to take intellectual, emotional, physical risks. Everybody out there, is your workplace safe for people to take those intellectual risks? Can they say, hey, I have an idea, and not have a public beheading, okay? So safety, belonging. We all crave to be part of something, to know that we are not alone out there on the frontier. Belonging is that deep need to be part of a tribe, to know that we have value to that tribe, to know that we are equal to everybody else in that tribe. If you look at human beings and social attachment theory and how human beings, we, were, we rely on other human beings for years before we're independent. So social attachment is very powerful for us. So that belonging need is very core, mm -hmm. mattering. We have to know that we individually matter. Look, if one of you guys disappeared off the face of the planet, there would be a Michael-sized hole, a Vala-sized hole in the hearts of all the people in your life. You know, you do make a difference. You're not just a cog in a wheel. And our people need to feel that, that, that they are bringing their unique gifts. When you foster that safety, that belonging, that mattering in your company, that is the first step to getting into the smart tribe and the smart state. And then as we add on the smart tribe accelerators, the five accelerators for tremendous performance that make people really happy 
and really productive. Guys, the limit. So, so to our audience and to yourself, Christine, if you see Michael and I madly typing, it's because we're trying to tweet <laughs> your words of wisdom, and you've dropped Thank so you. much science on us in the first five minutes. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, so when you talk about safety, uh, you know, belonging, mattering, which one of these um, is, is most impactful in terms of shifting us from the smart state back to critter state? Is there one where, you know, if, if, if there's a, a change that, that we feel unsafe or, or, or if, if the sense of belonging goes away, or, or are they all equal in terms of balance, in, in terms of keeping us from, you know, in a, in a positive state that, 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 we wanna, that we wanna be in? Okay, good, good. Uh, so, so the way Maslow rates them, and then I want to ask everybody kind of what drives you and show you some signs, okay? Mm -hmm. The way Maslow rates them is uh, safety is at the bottom. you got to have safety. You know, next, if you have safety, okay, yay, you know, then belonging and then mattering. Here's the thing. If someone's got a gun to your head, you don't care if you're in a tribe or not. You know, you don't care if you're important or significant. You just don't want to die, you know? So safety is pretty, pretty raw and pretty primal. And this is where I see most companies get in trouble. Uh, when they have a culture where there are clicks, right? What, is, what are clicks? Clicks are, uh, are breakages in belonging, right? Different silos, right? People don't feel safe because we're not all in this together. Oh, that click is more important. They get more budget. They're special. Let, let me just give you a really quick way of figuring out Sure. What a human being craves. We all crave safety, belonging, and mattering, but you can actually code who craves what most. And if you just focus on giving them what they crave, you will already start shifting them into their smart state. Safety people. People who crave safety, when they are in their critter state, they take safety away. They spread fear. You know the phrase, misery loves company? Okay, right. that's what this is about. So right. you can find out if a person spreads a lot of fear, they probably crave safety because what they're doing is they're trying to have, make everybody have the same emotional experiencing they're ha experience they're having. Okay? So stay with me on this because it's kind of deep, but it's really profound. Sure. Belonging. <laughs> the, people who, the people who crave belonging, who want to be part of something, the people who crave belonging, when they're in their critter state, when they're in fight, flight, freeze, they take belonging away. They form silos. Uh, oh, they gossip. They gossip, you know. I know right. stuff that you don't know, so they, they separate people because they feel like, like they don't belong, so they don't want anybody else to belong. Mattering. The mattering people who really want to be acknowledged and appreciated and make a difference, they take mattering away when they're in their critter state, so they make people feel smaller. Does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. It does. So your goal then is to work with the individuals and then help management bring together those individuals to coalesce in a positive way so that those individuals end up forming a smart tribe. So you have smart individuals forming a smart tribe. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And to your point, Michael, so we want the leaders to understand these techniques. Mm -hmm. We want the managers to understand these techniques. We want you know, the supervisors and the workers to understand these techniques. So we want them to spread either whether it's bottom up or whether it's top down. We want these to spread throughout the organization so that people can help each other get in and stay in their smart state. So safety, belonging, and mattering is sort of the very basic raw primal foundation then we start layering on the other tools, the tools for influence, you know, the tools for focus and clarity, the tools for sustainability, to, for high accountability. Um, I think we should mention really quickly how we're going to do a treat for everybody who's on this show. Yeah, please, please. Yes. Please okay, good, good. So we've been talking about this fabulous, exciting new book, and I wanted to do a treat for my dear friends Michael and Bala, and so here's what we're going to do. That's if awesome. you guys go to Smart Tribes book.com and you'll see it on the little banner below my name see if I can do this yeah yes. <laughs> smart <laughs> smart tribes book.com and just join our tribe just like I don't know it's like first name last name email address join our tribe everybody who joins the tribe during this show and for 15 minutes after and then we'll grab some random people as they watch the replay 
will win um, a book. We're going to do a drawing. We're going to have 10 people that we're going to grab um, off of the uh, uh, people who join our tribe in the next chunk of time, 10 minutes after the show is over. And um, we will email you and say, you won a book, yay, and we'll ask you for a physical mailing address. So 10 books are gift. I, I highly recommend you all take advantage of this. My, I'm a member of the tribe. My manager's a member of the tribe. So uh, please, uh, please do that. So, so when you walk into a company and, and you're there to advise the CEO or the executive team, how quickly can you, or what are the attributes that allow you to quickly determine whether there are smart tribes within the company or, or as a whole? Are there, are, there, are there four or five attributes that are, that are immediate to you where you can de determine whether we're in a smart state or a clear state? Yes, okay, so good, good, good. Uh, when we, w first of all, Vala, we're always brought in for a reason. That's always telling. We're brought in because, uh, oh gosh, let's see, some of our clients. Uh, one of our clients wanted to take their uh, profit per employee and quadruple it. Okay, so I want to increase my profit per employee. I need for you to help me with that, Christine, and your team. Um, I want p our engineers to be more emotionally engaged. Uh, right. I want our sales to close faster. I want our marketing messages to be more impactful. Uh, I want our um, R&D, our innovation to be much, much faster. So they usually come to us saying, I want blank, okay? And then whatever they want, we then are able to say, ah, good, okay, um, here are the techniques that we should use. Now, if people aren't sure if they're going to reach the next revenue inflection point, because often this is about, am I going to reach that next revenue inflection point? And is my profit also curving with my revenue? Here's a quick thing to jot down, everybody. Write this down. Go to christinecomeaford.com slash grow, G-R-O-W, christinecomeaford.com slash grow. It's brand new. It's an inflection point assessment. It's about 13 questions. It'll take you a whopping three to five minutes. Mm -hmm. Fill out the assessment, and then we will email you kind of what you need to do to get through that challenge, okay? And the first thing we're going to recommend is to have a very quick call with us so that we can ask you a few more questions and then sure. map out how you guys need to get there. But we always see that if there's a sales problem, then we've got the salespeople in the critter state, you know, in, that, in the critter state of their mind. If there's an R&D problem, that's where the critter state is. If there's an engagement problem, often upper management is spreading fear. Because here's the thing, when you talk to your people, you need to talk in terms of safety, belonging, and mattering. You can deliver a really challenging message about massive cost cutting, but if you couch it in the right way, if you frame it in the right way, then we can have that little critter brain go, oh, okay, I don't need to freak out and run safety programs, I'm going to be all right. You know, influence, which is a lot of what we do, is helping people learn meta programs and anchoring techniques and other neuroscience techniques to boost influence of their salespeople, their marketing people, their leaders. Influence is about being same as. So if you want to... Christine, yeah, good. Influence is about being seen as, same as... Same, same as. as. Same uh -huh. as. Oh, he is the same as me. I don't need to be scared. I'm an antelope. I thought he might be a lion, but I've realized he's an antelope just like <laughs> me. Oh, okay, he's not going to eat me, yay. Okay, so the, oh, this is important to mention. Thanks to Carnegie Mellon, uh, Stanford, Harvard, UCLA, Columbia, NYU, we now know that 90%, 90% of our behaviors are driven by our subconscious emotional brain. 90. Only 10% of our decisions and our behaviors are driven by our intellect. So it is it is essential, it is the most important thing on the planet to learn how to establish rapport with the emotional brain of a human being. Because that's where 90% of their decisions are made and their behaviors come from. So let's give a couple of uh, quick tools. Sure. Okay, so often leaders come to us and they say, we've got too many order takers, fix my people. And I say, well, gosh, I wonder who's giving the orders. <laughs> so, so one tool that we really like is inquiry over advocacy. Inquiry, asking questions instead of advocating. Here, do this. So when Bob comes to us and says, how do I do such and such? Yes, I get that it's tempting to just say, oh, blah, blah, blah. Go, do that, Bob. Now you just made Bob an order taker. But if you say, well, gosh, Bob, how would you do that? 
You know, what, what outcome do you really want to get? Who might you want to include? What might go wrong? What might go right? You know, then we start engaging. We're pulling Bob directly into his prefrontal cortex. We're building his leadership. We're building his ownership. We're getting him to start now being involved. Everybody write this down. The, the, the questions we want to ask somebody to pull them into their smart state, to get them not looking at the problem, but looking at the outcome, not being in their critter, but being in their smart state, are called an outcome frame. Okay? We cover the outcome frame very deeply in smart tribes, but I'm just going to give you the short, short, abbreviated pudding cup version of the outcome frame now, the five course meal of the outcome frames in the book. So the first question you want to ask somebody if they're, if they're conflicted, if they're stressed, if they're stuck, if they're just trying to uh, be an order receiver is, what would you like? Hey, what would you like? What do you want? And always ask it in a fascinated, curious way. Because now you're putting them here instead of, hey, what do you want? Okay, now you just put them in critter state. Forget it, they're scared. What would you like? What outcome would you like? Second question, hey, what would having that do for you? What would you get? What, ha what would having that do for you? The second question, they're going to tell you what emotional experience they want to have. Usually the second question tells you what they really want. I'll give you an example in a second. Third question, how will you know when you have it? You know, what proof mm. would show up? How would you know if you had it? Huh. And then fourth, hey, what are the next steps? So, example, what would you like? Oh, man, I really, I really want more strategic time. I'm just in the weeds all the time. Ah, okay, good. So you want more strategic time. What would having that do for you? Oh, I'd feel more creative. I frankly would enjoy my job more. I'd have more energy. Uh, I'd feel like I was making a difference. I wasn't just, you know, going through the minutia every day. I was, right. I was making a difference. How would you know when you had that? Well, if I had three hours a week to do strategy time, if I had, you know, whatever, a retreat every quarter where I could just go off and see the future and then bring it back to my team. Okay, great. Then I would know that I had it. Okay, good. What are the next steps? Ah, okay, well, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't have an open door policy. I personally hate open door policy. I think it's the worst idea ever. Okay? I like office hours. Because when you have an open door policy, it means, hey, I don't value my brain, so just come on and barge in whenever you want. You know? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you say, hey, I'm available for pop-in questions from 8 to 10 a.m. and from, you know, 4 to 6. You know, the rest of the time, my door is closed. You can't come in. I'm in strategy time. I'm in thinking. I'm in problem solving. Right. It makes people feel safe, again, back to feeling in your, being in your smart state because they know what the rules are. When people know what the rules are, when they're being asked questions, enrolled and engaged, smart state, when you have clear, explicit communication, not, can I have this report uh, on the top advertisers? Well, that didn't tell me anything. When's it due? What format? If it's, hey, I'd love a report on the top four advertisers in the Western region. Let's rank them by revenue. Can I have it Friday by four? You know, that was more explicit. The person is set up to succeed. Now they can ask you questions for clarity. Christine, Just, yeah. it, it seems like a lot of what you're discussing and presenting is teaching people how to communicate in a, in a, in a way that is more simultaneously more considerate, thoughtful, precise, and clear. Yes. Yes. And then setting up the structures in their company so that people feel safe, feel belonging. Ah, so now I know this, these, this is our tribal code of conduct. We send in our weekly status every Friday by 6 p.m. so that the management dashboard is filled in so everybody knows what to expect. You know? When we give people feedback, you know, we use a specific seven-step process to give them feedback so that we don't send them into fear. You know, when we use those inquiry techniques, influencing techniques, you know, there are three phrases. I want you guys to write this down, everybody listening. There are three phrases that when we use them, we can do all sorts of cool stuff because we're actually pulling that person into their smart state. So, for instance, I need your help. We call that a dom-sub swap. The dominant person becomes subordinate. The subordinate person rises up and becomes dominant. This is an awesome way to get a person to rise up to take more responsibility. So, wow, you know, Bob, I really need your help. You know, we're going to launch this new initiative. You know, how would you like to craft it? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And you're looping Bob in. You're emotionally engaging him, and now he wants to go forward. 
So I need your help. When you want to enroll and engage anybody, use that. And remember, always be like, wow, really sincere because this is really important and we want to put them in your smart state. Mm -hmm. Second, what if? So you know when you go to a concert and um, somebody throws a beach ball in into the <laughs> crowd and everyone's batting it around? Okay. Yeah. So what if is a way to do that? Because as leaders, sometimes we'll have an idea and we'll throw it out there and then we'll come back a week later and they're executing. And like that wasn't a directive, that was just a random idea. Yikes, and they thought that we were telling them to do that. They're like, whoa, 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 I was just brainstorming. What if is cool because we say, hey, you know, what if we all were to figure out, you know, three ways to really streamline our, um, our marketing programs? You know, you throw it out there, they bat it around, it enrolls and engages people. It says, here's just a crazy idea, you guys take it, craft it, make it yours. So I need your help to get them to rise up. What if to get them to own it, craft it, make it theirs? Uh, and then the third one is would it be helpful if? If you have a person who is really stressed out, you need, to, you need to intentionally pull them from their critter state, from their amygdala, straight into their prefrontal cortex. So example, <laughs> one of the things that we're pretty well known for is helping salespeople sell a lot more by using the influence techniques, which we'll get to briefly if we have a chance. So the ones I'm teaching you right now are some basic influence techniques, but we'll get into more advanced ones if we have time. Um, and then what happens? The CEO then says, let's raise the quotas because you guys are all performing so well. So then he goes around or she goes around and they raise all the quotas and then, and then they always say, <laughs> the people freak out, right? The sales people are like, ah, and they're all in their career state. And the CEO always says the same thing. Like they must have some code that they share. But the CEO always says, oh, call Christine. She'll use her neuro techniques. You'll be fine. Stop overreacting. You know, she'll put you right into your smart state. So, of course, then they call me. They're like, ah. <laughs> and the first thing I go ahead. Go ahead. The first thing I say is, hey, would it be helpful if, you know, we look at your pipeline, we look at your sure. key alliances, and so now they're suddenly out of, ah, and they're in, I wonder if that would be helpful. You, you, you know, you can actually see their eyes change. They're just now pulled into their prefrontal cortex, and now they're into, huh, helpful or not? What is the, what is the plan? What is the strategy? Sure. Would it be helpful if it's great when someone's really, really on the ledge and they're about to jump? Sure. You, you as a CMO, clearly influence is a very relevant, hot topic for me, and, and certainly for any, any business executive. And, and you regularly write a uh, brilliant Forbes post, and you wrote a fairly bold one titled recently, uh, you know, how to influence anyone, anywhere, at any <laughs> and, uh, teach, us, teach us how to do that. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, that title alone, you know, you have to click and read, but you talk about the <laughs> subconscious secret code, about it, code codes about influence. We'd love to talk uh, about influence uh, and, 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 and what these secret codes are. Teach us, okay. teach us how to... What if you would teach us <laughs> how to I need your help. <laughs> I need your help. Teach us how to influence anyone at any time. Anywhere. Anywhere. anywhere, anywhere. Yes, okay. Okay, Woo. Everybody grab your pens. I hope you wrote down the outcome frame, and I hope you wrote down the three influencing phrases, the what if I need your help, would it be helpful with? Yes. Um, write down these, these four pairs, okay? Sure. Toward, dash, away. Options dash procedures, general dash specific, active dash reflective. We're going to go through each one. Uh, in the 1970s, Leslie Cameron Bandler, one of the pioneers of neurolinguistic programming, discovered 60, 6 0. Ah, that makes me go into my critter state. <laughs> That's too many <laughs> meta programs. And we found, really frankly, that about six, sometimes we'll use eight with a client, really move the needle profoundly. So we're going to start with four, and then you guys can learn a bunch more in Smart Tribe. So four is good enough. If you do four, the ones I'm going to teach you right now, plus safety, belonging, and mattering, you are in. And use those influencing phrases. It will really boost your ability to influence outcomes. Toward away. Meta programs operate on a range, so people aren't necessarily black or white, you're toward or away. They might be middle-ish, but you have to pick which one they lead with, okay? This is not Myers-Briggs, this is not DISC, that's way up here. This is 
subterranean operating systems way down deep. Toward people are motivated at a deep subterranean level to getting goals. Get, attain, achieve, I want stuff. So think about your customer, your, your team, your key team members, your direct reports, etc. Anybody you want to influence, are they toward, get, attain, achieve? Or are they away? Prevent disaster, solve problems, mitigate risk. Okay, first, how do they sort? Okay, remember, this is somebody's operating system. How do you find out if they're toward or away? It's pretty easy. You can basically just say, hey, you know, um, why do you have the job that you have? You know, why are you in the career that you're in? You know, and you will hear it's because I want to get, attain, achieve, or it's because I want to solve problems, etc. Okay, next, uh, options, procedures. Options people like a list of criteria. Hey, why'd you pick your car? Black, fast, good mileage. <laughs> Procedures people like a step-by-step -step process. They don't want a lot of choice. Hey, why'd you pick your car? Well, you know, oh, it's interesting. Here comes the story. I was at my Aunt Sue's house, and I didn't really like my car, so I drove hers. And then I went online to check it out. And then I talked to my mechanic. You can hear the little steps. You can hear the little process. Now, options people, the world is their oyster. They want lots of choice and possibility. Procedures people, no, no, no. I don't want lots of choice. I want a proven X number of steps process. So if a salesperson or marketing person is speaking in options and possibilities and features and benefits <laughs> to a procedures person who just wants to hear proven five step process, out of rapport, no influence, not gonna work. So when you think about this, options people like to create procedures for somebody else to follow. Procedures people, if you interrupt them in their flow, they will then rewind back to the previous procedure that they were talking about. So they're on step three, and you ask them a question, they're going to go back and they're going to repeat step one, two, and three before they go on to step four. For options, procedures people, why did you pick your current job, your work, your car? You know, Think about this in terms of uh, understanding what truly deeply motivates somebody. The third meta program, general or specific. General people, they can deal with specifics, but they start by looking at the overview. They start by looking at the 10,000 foot, and then they drill down. The specific people, they start down in the weeds, and then they start to bubble up. Specific people sometimes can have a hard time doing the high-level strategy stuff. The generalists sometimes have a hard time getting the specifics of the given project. Think about the general or specific nature of your prospect of your boss, of your board member, of your spouse, of whoever you want to influence. How do you solve problems? Describe your weekend. Hmm. How was your weekend? Oh, it was great. Then they move on, general. How was your weekend? Oh, we went boating. Oh, this boat. It was wood. <laughs> it was oak. This guy grew the tree, and then he cut it down. And you're like, okay, your weekend was good. You know, like 20 minutes later, you're like, okay, bye, good weekend. <laughs> You know, general or specific. Okay, the last one that we're going to go over, active reflective. Nike, the Just Do It campaign. Right. The Nike Just Do It campaign is just act. I don't care if you make a mistake. Act, act, act. So the, the crazy, quick, take action people, active. Reflective. Reflective people want to understand. They want to consider. They want to analyze. Then they're going to take action. Active people might be too hasty. Reflective people might get stuck in analysis paralysis. This is why there's no better or worse meta program. We all need each other. But what's interesting is when we look at the active reflective people, you know, how do you discover opportunities at work? You know, well, you know, there's a there's a somebody comes to me and they ask me to consider this particular thing, and then I'll go off and I'll analyze it. Or the active people sometimes will create fires to fight because they need to be in momentum. When we understand if somebody is, for instance, toward procedures, specific, and active, we'll go, ah, the person I'm going to talk to right now, the person I'm going to craft this message for, wants to get, attain, and achieve things, but they want a specific step-by-step -step process. They want to know what the details are. That's how they're going to feel safety, belonging, and mattering. And then they want to take decisive action. I'm going to read you... Um, Two uh, quotes. One is from when someone's not speaking in meta programs, and one is when somebody is. Okay, here's the here's the CFO to the CEO. The CEO is toward get attain achieve. Options, lots of choice and possibility. General, keep it net net and active. Let's hurry up and go. Listen to this and tell me if this worked or not. I've been considering our teleconference bill 
and I think we could save 30% or more, save 30% or more. We need to analyze conference services and cloud possibilities because I'm concerned we're overspending by 35 grand a month. And I'm thinking through the best process to identify a qualified but cost-effective service. Okay, the CEO who was like, come on, come on, get it done, you lost him on, on the first sentence. <laughs> He's coding, not like me. You know, and the CEO we worked with, whose CFO said this, he's like, I don't think our CFO is going to work out. Wow, is he exhausting and draining and boring. And so we worked with the CFO, and then the CFO said, check this out. Here's the, the rewrite. I want to speak with you about our goal, get, attain, achieve, to not just double revenue this year, but also increase profitability. I have some cost-cutting options, because the world is your oyster, baby, and I'd like to, that I'd like to propose. Are you interested? So a few months down the road, when those crucial conversations happen and the CFO speaks in the CEO's meta programs, the CEO can hear those messages, has tremendous credibility and trust with the CFO, and guess what? CFO is now on the president track. Yay. Uh, and the CFO is going to be fired. Uh, Again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of a quick, powerful, and we, we cover this stuff. Really, the influence stuff is really deep sure. in chapters 2, 6, and 7. Okay. But that's like the world's fastest training on med programs. Yeah, but, but I mean, in summary, as you said at the beginning, influence is same as. You know, when the CFO can speak the language that the CEO can relate to and understand, you have influence. Yes. Thank you. That was a perfect net net. When the CMO is talking to the CIO in the CIO's meta programs. Yes. This is what influence is. Forget what your meta programs are. I'm sorry, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is the meta programs of the person that you want to influence. You speak in their meta programs. They experience the same as. They loop arms with you subconsciously. You walk forward to the glorious future that is win-win for both of you. You know. Now I'm and going through budget cycles right now. So this CXO <laughs> talk, I'm going to be watching for you know five times in a row. <laughs> As I go ask for more budget. So this is good. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you figure out the meta programs yes. of your CFO and you yes. speak in those. And, and let me talk, let me say one quick thing about this. Sure. Oh, and go to smarttribesbook.com, you guys, and join our tribe so you can be part of the uh, book drawing. Here's the thing we can't talk in meta programs all the time, or we'd be like weird meta program spewing robot things, you know? <laughs> We really just want to look for what are those moments when, yes, well, I want to ask for more budget. I want to get my spouse to agree to such and such. I want to get my kid to finally change her homework habits. You know, I want to get my direct report to rise up. I want to get my boss to stop micromanaging, whatever, right? You pick what that behavior is that you want to change. Here's your recipe. Write this down. You figure out what the meta programs are of the recipient of your message. You figure out what influencing phrase, what if, I need your help, would it be helpful if, would, would be a double whammy. And often people like to start with, I need your help, and then pop in a little what if part way through. Okay, so meta programs, influencing phrase. Okay, what do they crave alone in the dark? Safety, belonging, or mattering? If it's mattering, wow, I need your help, man. You are just the exact person for this project. I'm so counting on you. Heavy mattering, okay. Belonging, wow, I'm so psyched that you're part of this tribe. What, how can we expand our team? Who else can we loop in? Who else can we include? Safety, wow. Let's really look at how we can, how we can create more innovation and risk taking here. I would love if you could help me kind of craft a process, a program, so we could all you know, take more risk in a safe and sane way, et cetera. So can you tell them a little bit procedural? <laughs> the med, see, I just, I just broke my flow. Right, so let's figure the meta programs out, figure the influencing phrase, figure out the safety belonging mattering for, figure out the behavior that you want to influence. You want to either change this behavior right. or introduce a new behavior. Right. And then craft that message. Craft right. that message, deliver it. You're going to deliver one to three influencing messages before the behavior changes on its way. You won't, you won't do this forever. It'll be pretty fast. Right. Christine, uh, what if for marketers, there are, marketers are always thinking about digital influence. How do I influence consumers? How do I find the influencers that are out there in my particular market or brand, what have you? So how does this kind of uh, psychologically based approach to understanding people and communicating and being empathetic 
and driving influence in personal situations, how does that translate to online influence and understanding influence influencers in the broader online world? Good, good. OK, thank you, thank you. So when you write copywriting, copy editing, right? when you do any copy, you speak in the meta programs of the recipient of your copy. Now, just a sec. I was just with a huge company, and they said, oh, Christine, this is going to be impossible. We've got nine different customers. Oh my god, it's going to be so hard. We did a workshop. We did an influence workshop half day, brought in all their marketers in one location, flew to another location, brought in all their marketers in that location, and what's so totally cool is we took those big sheets, those big flip chart sheets, and we wrote down the meta programs of each of their different customers, their different target markets, and then we found when they all were spread around the room, oh my gosh, <laughs> we actually only have two types of messages we have to give. Yeah, we had two sets of meta programs. I don't care that they had different titles, you know. We had two different sets of meta programs. That makes our marketing so much easier. So now we can have lots of reusable marketing messages. And we also know with the rapport techniques that we teach in uh, chapter six of our fabulous book, Smart Tribes, um, that only 7% of the communication comes through in the written, right? So if you're going to do email marketing, I'm cool with that. But sooner or later, you need to use the 93% more of an experience that you get when you have video. So for instance, if you guys were just reading this blog as opposed to having this interactive experience, how would it be for you? I think it would be really wicked different. You know? So we want the extra 93% that we get. We want the mirror neurons. So right now, some of you guys who are watching this are probably feeling kind of pretty psyched and energized. Hmm. Thank you to mirror neurons because I'm psyched and energized. You're watching me. Subconsciously, we all want that connection and that safety belonging and mattering. This is why we watch movies and we cry. This is why we watch movies and the guy gets the girl and we cheer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Social, social attachment theory, friends. Social yeah, attachment ahead. theory. I want to shift gears a little bit because yeah, yeah. Um, one of your um, one of your most popular Forbes posts, nearly three hundred thousand uh, views and reads. Talked about uh, uh, when you had an opportunity to meet Steve Jobs. Yeah. And, and you said in, in this post, an incredibly popular post, that uh, you know, he described the iPod and the iPhone and an iPad nearly two decades before <laughs> the product hit the market. And you also said that when you were in his presence, you, this is literally, you said, I, I could feel my brain expanding. It felt <laughs> so big around Steve to be open and limitless. So just you know, tell us about the story of how you had an opportunity to meet with him and, and that hour you spent with uh, you know, one of the greatest uh, executives in, in, in modern history. Okay, so um, everybody, here is why I want you to try these techniques. These techniques have helped me meet with Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, Ted Turner, Barbara Walters, uh, George W. Bush, Hillary Clinton, um, uh, Bill Clinton, um, Andy Michael Grove, Krigsman and Vala Ashbar. Michael Krigsman, Vala Ashbar, <laughs> Bruce McCaw, it goes on and on and on. Okay. <laughs> you belong in that tribe. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You, you, you can you matter? <laughs> so um, here's the thing. You have to find out what people want and give it to them. You know, now I know that uh, one of the famous things that Steve Jobs said, which actually is true, and we just did a bunch of marketing messaging that was crazy effective for one of our clients in the um, medical uh, space. Um, but people, people don't necessarily know what they want when it comes to products and services, so you have to tell them what they need. Okay, so there's that, which I thought was always interesting about Steve. He was telling people what they need because Steve had the ability to go out into the future and come back and say, this is the world that we're going to live in, so you need to have this stuff, you know? Um, so super, su his brain was interesting because he could be really general and really visionary, and then he could really drill way down. You know, it's not often that you get that general specific combo. Oh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates, very similar mind uh, as well, and how he would kind of traverse realities. Um, so really, what I did to meet uh, Steve Jobs was I sent a series of compelling FedExes. And I called. And I stalked him, basically, but in a fun and bouncy way. 
And finally, you know, he just got on the phone after like all these calls and just said, okay, fine, five minutes. You know, so I brought my little egg timer. Remember those egg timers that your mom used to use? <laughs> they went kind of like tick a tick a tick 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 tick. Yeah, but like the little white ones, you turn the little dial. So I brought that and I put it on his desk and it was like going tick 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 tick. And I was like, okay, so since I have five minutes, I want to ask you some questions, you know. So we were talking about, you know, his vision and everything. And the little timer goes off and goes ding. And I go, okay, well, it's been fun. You know, and I start to get up and walk away. And he's like, I'm not done with you yet. Sit down. <laughs> we go for another 45 minutes. Um, and what was really cool was that when my uncle, my dad died from pancreatic cancer, but it was like, it was a really extreme case. And, and it was it was gnarly from the very, it was stage four by the time when we found it. So there was really not much we could do. But when my uncle got pancreatic cancer, I called up Steve's office. And, um, and I talked about some of the alternative therapies you know, to see if those would help my uncle. And it was just kind of cool. You know, it was like there was this connection that was still there, even though I had met him, God, what, 20 years earlier? Wow. I don't know, a long time. So what's interesting is when you bring people safety, belonging, and mattering, when you use these influencing techniques, you also become memorable. Why? Because you connect with that person at a level that they don't experience that often. You know, when you bring somebody the most precious food that they can't get, that's not easy to get, that experience of profound safety, that experience of, hey, I've got your back, you know, and here's how I'm going to show that I've got your back, and no matter what happens, I'm totally here for you. That's, that's pretty cool. rare. That you know? is so cool. That is a... It's so cool. And th that is a great way to end this segment of CXO Talk. Yeah on that particular note of deep communication and really being empathetic and caring in a business context. That's a wonderful way to end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, you so much. What, what an amazing, amazing, amazing yes. session. I we really can't wait to reflect on all your words of wisdom <laughs> and share it with, uh, with our audience in uh, our upcoming blogs. So thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be of service, guys. Thank you. Great. Our Hello. Pleasure. Good to see you Michael, again. Great, great. What a great show. Yes. <laughs> I, learned, I learned so much from it's, every guest. I mean, hearing this, it's, it's like it's, it's, management it's, advice, just, it's like the graduate, graduate, graduate level school of management th advice. This, this was doctorate degree level, yes. <laughs> of course. Our guest today has been Christine, and I call her Christine High Bandwidth <laughs> Thomaford, and now everybody, you know why. And we appreciate, Christine, your joining us. And for everybody who's been watching, we thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye-bye.